All right, so this is my Tech Ball annual plan presentation. Uh, my name is Christian Shepard, and I'm a Marquette University Sports Performance Intern Coach. Um, I wanted to show a video of the game, but I'm just going to do my best to describe the sport here. Uh, so it's basically a good combination between uh, soccer and ping pong uh, in the sense that it's on a ping pong table. However, this table is curved, and um, and it's like uh, ping pong in the sense that the ball goes back and forth, um, but it's also like soccer and how you have to use your body uh, to return the ball. So you're able to use your entire body other than your hands and your arms, uh, but you're allowed to chest bump it or do headers or any of that stuff. Uh, and so it can be played with two people, which would be singles, or four people, which would be doubles. And um, it's, when it's played competitively like this, it's in an indoor environment uh, on a hard surface like this, very similar to like a normal basketball court. And then it's best of three sets, um, and then that gives you one point, and it's the first team or player to 12 points. Uh, and so you're, the last rule that's interesting is that you're not able to touch the same body part uh, twice with the ball. So if you uh, return the soccer ball with your knee, you couldn't then use your, your right knee again um, to like basically juggle it into, into action. So uh, for my sport analysis, this is an open skilled sport. Uh, it's non-contact and it's a team sport. Uh, it can be played singles, like I said, but that's what I focused on. Uh, the rallies typically last from 5 to 40 seconds, and then the match uh, lasts 30 to 60 minutes. And so it's just repeated high-intensity efforts with basically 10 seconds or so in between um, possessions. And so it's very frontal plane dominant, uh, very similar to like tennis in that way, how you're always facing forward and you constantly have to shuffle laterally, uh, change directions, and accelerate and decelerate in those positions. Uh, and then there's also a little bit of jumping and landing involved with the sport whenever you want to do a header or a, or a kick. Um, and like I said, you can also juggle it or chest bump it. Those are the, the primary motions. Uh, so for my needs analysis, um, the first thing that I prioritize is anthropometry. Uh, so uh, successful athletes in this sport tend to be very lean and have limited muscle mass. Um, it's advantageous for them to be uh, of, of a lighter body weight and to minimize the fat they're carrying around to uh, be able to move as quickly as possible. Um, other things that are in high demand for this sport are change of direction qualities, uh, power, and mobility as they are required to move quickly side to side. Um, make quick decisions, and then get into extreme positions, as seen in this photo here. His head is all the way above his, uh, or his foot is all the way above his head, and um, positions like that happen often in the sport. And then for a moderate demand, I had endurance, because they have to recover in between sets uh, to do another high intensity possession. Uh, for low demand, I put strength and linear speed, as they are not required to ever uh, move anybody. It's a non-contact sport, and uh, we want enough strength to help with the change of direction qualities, but we don't need much more outside of that, and then they will never reach max velocity in the sport, too. Uh, for my injury analysis, uh, the most common injury is knee sprains and tears of the ACL, MCL, and meniscus, hamstring tears, and ankle sprains for inversion and eversion. Um, and these all commonly happen when an athlete basically goes for a goes for the soccer ball when it's with uh, when it's out of reach. Um, so if it's too too far in front of you or too high above you, and you try to go uh, too quickly, uh, too far out of position, then this is when injuries happen. Uh, and for the ankle sprains, those happen when you are jumping for the ball either with a header or you're kicking it above your head and then you kind of land awkwardly. But overall, you don't get very injured in this sport and most injuries you can recover pretty quick from. Uh, for physical testing and evaluation, my number one was DEXA body composition because I think keeping my athletes lean and light is gonna be uh, the biggest thing to keep track of for their success. 
Uh, the second one is the modified functional movement screen uh, to make sure that their mobility is good enough um, to reach the positions that they need to uh, safely. Uh, and then for the pro agility, I did that because this sport is very change of direction dominant and it's played in a very confined area. And so, and then the benefit of doing uh, specifically pro agility is that we have decades of, of testing uh, to compare our numbers to. And then I did a vertical jump one just to have lower body vertical power um, as that's needed for headers. And then a rear foot elevated split squat uh, for unilateral strength to make sure that we are able, or we're strong enough to do change of direction things at a high level. So for the plan, uh, our off season is from January to May and it's four times a week is physical training and then three times a week is tactical training. So our main goals for our off season are to develop technical coordination, work capacity, tendon strength, and mobility. Uh, so there are four major movements uh, for this one workout example would be triple extension, squat, hinge, and an extensive plyometric. Uh, paired with all of these, there's going to be some sort of core and mobility exercise. Um, and so to get into the specific exercises, I have a hand clean high pull, a goblet squat, a dumbbell RDL, and jump rope. And like I said, having those core and mobility movements paired with that. Um, and then the training variables that I had for this phase would be uh, volumes very high, um, the intensity is pretty low, and then the set range is three to five, the rep range is four to 15, and we want the time under tension and the range of motion to be high, uh, and then the velocity of the movements to be a bit slower. Uh, and then we wanna progress these movements uh, from the hand clean high pull, for example, to the power clean um, by increasing the technical complexity of the movements, increase the range of motion and the time under tension, um, and then we also want to increase the intensity from these movements. So progressing from the goblet squat to the pause squat. And so for the preseason, this is from June to July. And this is three times a week physical training and four times a week tactical training. Our major goals for this block uh, is, or phase would be strength, conditioning, and mobility. We want to keep that mobility in year round because it's such a high requirement for these athletes. Uh, the workout structure uh, for one example workout in this uh, phase would be an overhead Olympic movement, a push, a knee flexion movement, and then some non-impact conditioning. Um, and we want to keep those core and mobility, mobility exercises paired with our movements, but then also start to include some intensive plyometrics uh, to get more specific into our sport and develop that uh, strength and power we're looking for. Uh, so for specific movements, we have a single arm a uh, dumbbell push press, uh, a bench press, and a Nordic curl um, for those movements. And then we're going to, and, the, and the, the training variables for this phase would be having a moderate volume, a high intensity set range of three to five, a rep range of two to eight, um, time under tension and range of motion and velocity all being moderate. Uh, and we want to mainly progress these movements uh, primarily through intensity and so uh, just trying to get really strong at a few, at a few lifts um, is our main focus in the preseason. So progressing the push press to a landmine split jerk um, and other progressions like that. Uh, so for our in season, that's from September to November. Um, we have three times a week physical training, four times a week tactical training, plus games, and then also we're trying to peak for our November championship. So our goals for in season are power, change of direction and mobility. And our workout structure for this would be triple extension again, uh, a lunge, a vertical pull and a mobility series. And so again, pairing with the core mobility because it's so important for these athletes and then including the intensive plyometrics here as well and progressing them along in that way. For specific exercises, I had a block power snatch, a pin split squat and a chin up and my volume was low to, high, low to moderate here. Uh, my intensity was moderate to high, and then my set range was three to five, rep range two to six. Um, my time under tension was low to uh, prevent DOMS from happening 
because we don't want excessive fatigue in the in, in, in the in season. Uh, the range of motion was moderate and the velocity is high. So with both the block power snatch and the pin split squat, we can do these movements uh, with the concentric focus and being power oriented. And the same thing with the intensity being moderate to high, we'll be right in that sweet spot to develop that power. And then we want to progress the movements later in the in season uh, by actually decreasing technical complexity so that they can more focus on their sport. Um, we want to utilize top sets to main maintain our strength that we develop throughout the year. Uh, we want to increase the velocity by, like I said, decreasing the intensity uh, and also by utilizing clusters. And then uh, we want to decrease range of motion and time under tension. And so for the last thing, transition, we want to uh, allow this time for athletes to recover um, and have some time off away from the sport. So complete picture in the off season, we want really high volume. Um, and physical side is our number one priority in the in season. The technique takes the number one priority and the volume really drops off and then we try to peak for that major competition. And that is all. If there's any questions, I'd love to answer them. Um, what does a typical week, usually like game schedule look like? You're training three days a week and then like is there any adjustment? Yeah, so there's mostly tournament style is how they do it. Um, and it's a week per week basis. Um, but you, those don't really qualify you for, I mean, like depending on how you do in those tournaments, um, sets up how you're gonna be ranked within the championship. And so you can kind of play those tournaments as often as you want, but generally they're like once a week on the weekends. And then the more of those you do, you get a better rank. Um, and then there's usually a really big uh, championship tournament thing uh, in November. You mentioned um, rear foot elevated split squat as one of your tests. Mm -hmm. I was curious, is that something you're having them do one RM? Or? Yeah, I think I would do um, like an isometric test there and try to uh, get them in that rear foot elevated split squat position uh, and potentially do an isometric test, seeing how much force they can produce. Um, and we would want to set a baseline and make sure that all athletes are, are reaching that is, is what the goal would be. You mentioned that you had um, one of the important things was body composition, right? And mm -hmm. Making sure that uh, your athletes weren't too muscular or, or whatever. So how would you, what would you not do um, that might cause them to become like, too muscular? Like what kind of training mechanisms are you trying to stay away from? Um, well, part of my off season was higher rep training, uh, but it was pretty short the amount of time we spent to, from that. And it was the furthest away from our uh, competitive in season. And so having really high rep training can help build that uh, muscle size, but we don't want to spend too much time in that um, zone. So we just kind of have it at the very beginning of the off season and then don't really touch it again uh, for the rest of the year. And then we keep, or then we include the non-impact conditioning um, towards the preseason because we want to try to lean out as much as we can um, and also prepare, prepare our athletes for all the endurance needs that they have for their sport. Um, I think that first uh, half of that off season would be where we're spending uh, a good chunk of time in higher volume, higher rep training. Do you like a number on that? Um, well, I believe the the off season is like five months, so it would be like about two and a half months. The tests that you have in there, are there any of those tests that you mentioned on the screen? Yeah, um, if I go back to them, just for everybody's sake, um, the the DEXA I don't think would need to be done very often at all. I think that could be done uh, maybe at the beginning of the year, uh, the end of off season, 
and maybe once more uh, before in season, just so that you can confirm that the what you wanted to happen did happen. But yeah, I don't think it would adjust many training decisions, but it's more just your confidence in um, sending your athletes out there to, to compete. Um, but for the mobility one, I think that could be done uh, once a month and the other tests could be done even less frequently than that, um, maybe once every two or three months. Are there any times during the year outside of after a particularly arduous game that you'd expect to see vertical jump numbers decrease? Yes, I think uh, the vertical jump test here can be very helpful for tracking the effectiveness of the training or how difficult the in-season is for the athletes and how they're tolerating all of that. Um, so as great as it is to know their vertical power, it, it's more so an insight on uh, their readiness more than anything else and their, their response to the training. Yes, I think that would be okay. Um, I think in the off season, that's when uh, we can most expect uh, and even want our vertical jump numbers to go down a little bit. Um, and we'll, we'll undulate a little bit the intensity so to allow them to come back up and have that super compensation effect. But at points throughout the off season, I think it's good to have that, those vertical jump numbers come down. Um, I think developing overhead uh, stability can be beneficial for all athletes, uh, even if they aren't going to ever, I mean, they still have their hands above their head very often. Um, and so I think being balanced in that position um, is going to be beneficial for those athletes. And they constantly, even though they don't physically touch the the ball with their arms, um, they still are swinging their hands around to kind of counterbalance uh, whenever they're trying to get into those positions to, to return the ball. So their arms, their arms and their, their upper body is still very involved. 